Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, I am excited to have Stephen from the Anarcho-Christian Podcast, and he also has a very popular Facebook page of Anarcho Christian. We'd rather serve God than serve Caesar, you know me? Right. I'm just trying to live what he said. I'm just trying to live what he said. I ain't scared. I will take one to the head. Go ahead. So it's safe to say that I'm bad. So it's safe to say that I'm bad. The OG Anarcho Christian Stephen. <laughs> I've, been, I've been wanting to say that all week. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know about OG, but... um. You know, it has been a lot of fun, and I I feel like this project that we started a couple of years ago has really gained a lot of traction recently. Why don't you give us a little uh, background of who Steven is and how you got to where you are now? Okay, Um, I am a Christian anarchist, obviously, (laughs) and but I wasn't always, and I would say that as far back as I can remember actually having an opinion on politics, I was a, you know, a Republican or conservative um, in, in your most basic sort of way. And I wasn't always a Christian either. Uh, Now these two things were pretty much separate most of my life. And I think you know, growing up at, throughout the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, it it really was something that could be kept separate. And I could be wrong if it, it could just be my experience, but it seems like those two things have really collided uh, maybe since 9-11. And it's something that just goes together now. It's, uh, you know, Christianity and, and politics just seems to be inseparable. So, you know, just kind of growing up as a um, not a Christian, as a as an agnostic most of the, most of my life, uh, but yet with, you know, a Christian background and, and things like that, um, you know, I I became a Christian or what I would say I, I became a Christian uh, in my adult life. But today I'd even say that. I don't, I did not do anything at that time that that I would consider representative of you know a Christian lifestyle or Christian values, and the political side of it, with becoming a a, a Republican or a conservative, it, it's just kind of funny because my Christian values and my Republicanism they kind of um, collided together, much like I, I said that you know it, it's what we've seen socially. And I kind of went right along with that where Christianity adopted, you know, conservatism and this Christian conservatism is what actually grew in me where it's just the rhetoric of the Republican party and, and conservative values. And, uh, as, as you grow into your Christianity and your Christian faith, well, you're obviously growing in your determinism for republicanism and conservative values. And just over the years, that really started to weigh on me. I've always been somebody who, even if I wasn't acting consistently in my beliefs, I was always trying to find consistency and and go in that direction and become more consistent. And as I did that, like, like I mentioned, you know, my faith and my politics are are combined at this point, just like I, I think so many in the church are, um, then my faith started to grow and my politics started to change as well, right along with that. And uh, like I said, going toward that consistency in my theology and consistency in my my politics and my ethics and my morals and how those things interact with with my faith and all of that, you know, long story short, that's what really drove me in this direction to leave the conservative rhetoric um, for something that was more consistent. You know, we talk about liberty and we talk about freedom and, and in Christianity, we talk about loving our neighbors and loving our enemies. And those two things just really grew together in, in parallel 
where I could see this change where I'm, I'm leaving behind the, the old Christian conservative rhetoric because of the inconsistency that I'm sure most people listening can, it can immediately identify with things that they've seen in other people or even in themselves. So without even getting into, you know, details of all that, I'm sure most people kind of recognize that. And that really, that consistency, that drive for consistency is what really drove me to this point now of just uh, abandoning the, the party partisan politics and, um, and letting those, those values of my faith and the values that we say that we have, you know, with ethics and with our, the way that we interact with our neighbors, um, you know, letting that stuff become more consistent in my life. And that's where I find myself now. So I'm <laughs> sorry to have rambled on a little bit there, but, um, that's, that's really it. No, that was perfect. And you and I have spoken in the past about how our paths are pretty similar and a number of, of Christians that are, are coming to the same type of thinking that we have. I don't know if I'm, if I'm living in an echo chamber on Facebook, you know, because a lot of I've got a lot of new Facebook friends that have the same ideals. But to me, it, it seems like there's more people coming to this this thought. Now, I understand there's always going to be more Christians that are statists than there are going to be voluntarists or anarchists. But to me, it seems like the number's growing, which is cool for me to watch, you know, because I've, I know people that when I talk to them, they have some anarchist leanings or libertarian leanings or are libertarians with some anarchist leanings, but they can't quite get on board, but they're, they're moving, you know, in that direction a little bit. Have you, have you noticed anything like that as well? Or is, is it just me and my Craig's little world of uh, his little echo chamber he's trying to create. Cause honestly, at this point, I wouldn't mind living in an echo chamber. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. And I hope so. And it, it does seem that way to me that, that there is this kind of increase in uh, frustration with the government and increase in interest outside of the political two-party system or even the three parties outside of the three-party system to, you know, to make things happen or to stop things from happening. And that stuff is always very encouraging. I don't think, you know, in our lifetime without something major, and I don't mean major like catastrophic, but just a, a major shift in, in philosophy or, um, or mindset of the public. I, I don't see something different happening unless there is some, like I said, some sort of major shift, you know, in ideology or, or even something catastrophic. I don't see there actually being a, a change to, to pull away from the, the current system that we have. I, I think the way that the American people are so ingrained in this, this sort of, you know, us versus them political party rivalry sort of thing, I, I think it's just too much. But I mean, things do start though. They they start at ideas, you know, and and I think that where we currently are, which is definitely the minority in, in the political world, but where we are right now is bigger than I would say ten years ago or, or twenty years ago. The the mindset of the people being interested in this uh, consistent idea of liberty and and not a I want liberty but sort of mentality. I, I think that it is possible that we have seen a lot of growth and a lot of people would point to the campaigns of Ron Paul in 2008 and 2012 as, as kind of this uh, awakening of this, this new libertarian or Liberty sort of mindset, you know, and, and from there, I, I think that there has been a lot of growth. I think there's been a lot of, of focus toward, maybe looking at libertarianism as some sort of other party or just, you know, bypassing that completely and going toward, uh, you know, anarchist or voluntarist and agorist routes and completely, you know, nullifying the whole thing, which is where I re would really like to see things go. I would like to just see the entire, you know, United States just, just say, no, we're not participating anymore. <laughs> about a, a voluntary society you know and i've had people tell me this as well so i like the idea of having a police force and a fire department and 
hospitals and all that. And I said, well, none of that's going to go away. I mean, and it's not, anarchism is not without rules. I'm trying to explain this to somebody today, but as, as a nation as a whole, it wouldn't be like a, a United States anarchy. You know what I mean? Like it's just a small, or you have voluntary societies, like more than one, that kind of just work together in their own little group. Yeah, a lot of people, um, they start trying to, they can't imagine any anything working outside of the current system. So we just need to fix the, the system by, you know, incrementally, pragmatically making it better. And I think a lot of this is because of, you know, government schooling and, and just the way we were brought up. And, and I was, you know, totally brought up in, you know, in public school. And we are so dependent on government, you know, where we, we think that the, the government needs to regulate uh, education and healthcare and housing and loans and banks and police. And we start to to try to figure out what's the best way to handle that, right? And so from the conservative side, you're trying to make it as, as little as possible, right? And so I'm talking about being consistent, you know, and if I think that, you know, these things are handled better without the government, well, I'll, I'll just expand that that theory into every field. You know, not just the government controlling the price of vegetables, but also the government controlling, you know, um, your your mail, you know, things like that, that we just, it's like, we, we can't even imagine the government not handling it, right? But the conservatives, they don't want a communist government, they don't want socialism, or so they say. But then when you start applying it to, you know, all of these things, and you start realizing, wait, this is, this is what socialism is, and it's this, you know, this government intervention in the market. And like I said, uh, people have trouble, I think, thinking outside of the current system to to imagine what a free market would look like, right? And so that's why your assumptions immediately jump to chaos and no rules and and there'd be no police. And then you have to, to walk through it, you know, and imagine, well, if there weren't police, it would leave an, an, an opening, a need in the market for uh, a police force, right? And so you would have, you know, voluntary contracts with private security companies. And this plays out in every sector, you know, anywhere where the government isn't, there exist private companies that compete with each other for your business, you know, and when they do bad, when they have bad business practices, they don't exist very long. You know, and of course, without the assistance of the government to, you know, keep them afloat. <laughs> but it, just working through those sorts of of things, I again trying to be consistent. We say we want liberty, we say we want justice, we say we want small government and no control, and start working through what that looks like. Sometimes it's scary, and you just have to. It's I don't think it would necessarily be scary in real life, but it's scary to the person who who has never imagined it who's never, who can't even imagine, you know, some of these, these fields not being completely or partially government regulated. Actually was, I was under the idea that it was chaos and it's not, you know, you know, what we are under right now is chaos. Government is chaotic. There's no way around it. I mean, if you can't, you can't look at, at government and see them as taxation is theft or the never ending wars on aggre of aggression, that's chaotic. And I agree with you. I don't think I'm under no illusion that we'll ever see this in our lifetime. And I don't, then it's not something, this is not, I'm not doing the bad Roman project because I think it's going to all of a sudden turn us into an anarchist uh, society. But I think if you, you know, you start the conversations and people kind of start latching on to it a little bit, a little bit of time, you know, maybe our children or, you know, grandchildren or their children, whatever you know, it'll start taking a hold. And I'm wondering if it will come more from the younger generation than, you know, I'll be 45 in May. So hopefully I've still got some years left. But, you know, I think as the people start getting older and seeing government for what it is, and if they have an alternative uh, solution or an alternative uh, route to go, then I think that it could latch on a little bit more. You know, we're not we're not advocating for chaos we just want to kind of we just want to be left alone man we just want to live our lives you know without any uh intrusion from anybody and 
government's pretty good at in, intruding on every aspect of our life. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think most people that are um, around right now and, you know, with some sort of voice, either podcasting or writing blogs or articles, or I think most of us, most adults, we were not brought up, you know, in libertarianism or voluntarism or anarchism. And I, I use these words a lot. I, I know that they can have different definitions depending on the listener, but I, I, I view them you know, as essentially the same thing. Our, our age groups, adults right now, they, they weren't necessarily brought up. The majority of us weren't brought up in, in this sort of understanding or philosophy. But there, I, I believe that there is going to be an increase in young people that are born, you know, in the 2000s that are growing up in this and they're going to be a generation that has, you know, been brought up with these from the beginning. And so I believe that that's probably easier to, to teach these things rather than to, to try to use these teachings and philosophies to, to correct a lifetime of bad teaching from, you know, government indoctrination centers, <laughs> public school. I think it's going to be easier, I think, for for kids in, in these generations to, to grow up with this focus toward actual liberty and actual voluntarism rather than trying to, to change people that have spent their whole lives, um, you know, in the current system and thinking that it, it just, this is the only way it can be. Uh, we just got to make it a little bit better, you know, for our, for our side. Hey folks, Greg here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page. And you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, and send us an email at the Bad Roman Podcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. So I don't know if I ever told you, I feel like I told you this before, but I when I was first introduced to Anarcho Christian, it was actually your private Facebook group. It was not your podcast. It was not your Facebook page. But I was in the, uh, the Dave Ramsey group, and they try to stay away from politics in that group, you know, on the posts and stuff. But somehow one of the threads got into politics and I started talking about being an anarchist. You know, and at the time I was kind of just wandering around as an anarchist. I was a Christian. You know, I could see how anarchism and, and Christianity coincide with each other. So I was just I felt like I was alone. Like, am I the only one that feels this way? Because the more I studied anarchism, the way I could I could see everything that Jesus teaches. But anyway, in this in this thread. So I don't mean, and I couldn't tell you who it was, but they mentioned your group. They even sent a link to their group and I joined their group and got in there. I was like, man, this is cool. There's a bunch of us. There's, 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 there's more than I thought, you know, and when I would talk to people about being an anarchist and how it aligns with my faith, you get that, you know, that they tilt their head to the side, like you're crazy because I came from the same background as a Republican and, you know, I was a full blown neocon and that happened the day 9-11 went down. And once I started noticing that, what the Republican Party is, there's nothing Christian about them. You can't put that type of ideology to me with what Jesus teaches. They use Christians to get votes, but they never follow through with any of the teaching. Yeah, that's really the way that we see a lot of the partisan politics now, that the Christian, you know, values and, and label, it's really is, it's used, and it's used on both sides, but we see it mainly with the, the moral majority of the, of the Republicans and the conservatives that I think that's the loudest, right? But we see politicians using that and using even specific things with, within Christian values, uh, like being anti-abortion. And the reason why I say they're using it is because we, you know, if you do honestly look back at the quote progress that they that they've made or haven't made in that, 
you see that the same people that are using it the loudest, that are using their platform and referring back to things that we hold dear, like loving people, not not killing people and relating that to abortion and things like that and these different sorts of um, political points, those same people, once they're elected and reelected, they don't do anything to actually further what they're talking about, you know, whether you agree with it or not. But that's what I'm meaning is that they're using these points for election and reelection, but then they're not actually doing anything with it because, you know, obviously that's job security, right? If they do get rid of these things that they talk about, then they're going to be out of a job next time. So they have to create these these big issues. And they have to create these boogeymen. And the thing is that these boogeymen and these issues, they can't actually go away if they're going to continue grandstanding and continue um, campaigning for their next election. I had somebody tell me the other day, she goes, as Christians, I think it's clear who we need to be voting for this election. And she was refer- referring to Donald Trump, obviously, because, well, it's, he's a Republican. He's got a he's got a. a an R by his name, that automatically means that's where Christians go. And I don't, I I used to be that guy too. And I don't, but but now looking back, I don't understand how you can follow the the teachings of Christ and then follow somebody that acts the way Donald Trump does. He's vulgar. He's still dropping bombs on children, weddings, hospitals. I read something the other day that they've, they funded Planned Parenthood more than even Obama did. There's like, well, he didn't do that. They told me, well, he's not funding the abortion part of it. I'm like, listen to what you just said. They're still, they're still performing abortions. They're still funding it. Yeah. And I think it was last year they had their, um, their biggest year in the number of abortions and the amount of money that they brought in from the, the government uh, payouts that they, that they get the actual name of, of the law escapes me right now, but, but yeah. And, and I think that the biggest part of this is that, you know, they've created the the boogeyman of the left and of the Democrats and um, it's intentional, right? Because the the more that you can get everyone worked up uh, mainly through fear, you can get them all worked up and they're on your side and they're voting for you no matter what. And it becomes things where we have to make excuses for the things that he's doing and saying and not achieving the things that he's promised and that is just the case with with the politics um, for both sides. That reminds me of something that a friend of mine told me. He worked inside of government, and he was familiar with uh, Carl Rove. And I don't remember the exact conversation that was this was sent, or was it, I think it was a letter. Something they were concerned about losing the the Christian vote. And Carl Rove's response was, "Don't worry about it. They don't have anywhere else to go." So they, just like you said, they use the left as the boogeyman based off of fear. When I, when 2016 rolled around, I can't tell you how many times I was told, if you don't vote for Donald Trump, you're actually voting for Hillary Clinton. And I'm like, well, that's garbage. I said, cause my vote's going to count. Well, I thought at the time that my vote was going to count towards the tally of the candidate that I voted for. But it turns out Donald Trump's no different than any of them. He's actually, to me, in a lot of ways, has, has been worse on a lot of issues that Christians are supposed to be behind. Yeah, it's really hard to say how that would turn out, um, you know, if if Hillary would have been in, in office rather than Trump. And and honestly, I think a lot of it would, would be the same. Um, we, the, the citizens of the United States, haven't actually seen um, any real progress toward any of the any of the, the major issues. You know, um, it's the same. The amount of spending is is going to be out of control, no matter if it's an R or a D in the White House. The, uh, you know, the infringement on constitutional rights uh, and human rights is going to be the same. It just it doesn't change at all. And, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, if if we would have had Hillary in the last four years would have been worse. And I, I just I don't think so. I, I think it would have been the same. There might have been a few small differences here and there where some things were maybe a little more or a little less. But overall, I, I think we pretty much have the same political candidate there. And it'll be the same for the next one. Yeah. It, well, to what, one thing that I've noticed, it seems like with every election, everything, it, gets, it just gets worse. There's nothing getting better about it. 
you know, as far as liberty is concerned or the killing of people that we'll never see or meet in our lifetime. You know, it, it just seems to be getting worse, you know, and then they came out the other day with uh, the peace deal with Afghanistan or the Taliban. And I'm very skeptical of it anyway, because it seems like the wording in that article or, or the wording in the in the treaty was leaves a lot of loose ends where they could renege on it pretty quick. So I don't I don't have a whole lot of faith that that's going through. Now I hope so. I mean, I'd love to see them in it. I just figured that they'll just go start another war somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I do think it, it's um, it's good for us to, I think, identify these things and say if this does go through, if this is legitimate, then that's great, and we need to be behind that. Um, I as well am skeptical of you know what's really going to happen, and if we do withdraw from one area, are we just going to shift? the troops and the resources and the focus just to a different area or, or are we actually going to scale things back, you know? And, um, I have my doubts that things are actually going to get scaled back, but I hope that it does. And when a situation like this does pop up with, you know, with, with, uh, actually signing a treaty and I, I hope that it happens, you know, it, it's very similar to, to the Iran deal that Obama made. And, um, it's like if this does happen, then great. This is something that's you know that is moving in the right direction. You know, should it happen? Well, of course, you know, a couple of years later, uh, that's all scrapped and thrown away, and we're back to you know bullying each other or you know making threats. And um, so yeah, it doesn't seem like anything actually changes, but I do think it is important to take those moments and, and to say, well, I hope I hope this will last. I hope that this will uh, legitimately happen. Yeah, and I think and, and I can't remember which episode it was that you did, but you spoke about the remnant, and I, you know, so if I get in, into discussions or debates on Facebook about this with people, it's when I'm talking to them or, or responding to their criticisms or whatever. I don't, I'm not necessarily talking to them. What I'm doing is trying to give something to the other people that are watching because I've, I've had Facebook posts just blow up, man, and just with hundreds of comments. And then I'll get messages. And this is what's encouraging to me. I, people will message me and they'll thank me for the stuff I'm saying because they don't hear it a lot. You know, you're not going to hear it on Fox News for sure. And you're not going to hear it from your parents talking about it or your friends. Because, it, But it's it's not a new idea. It's just not very prevalent out there. So I think if we just kind of continue planting seeds, man, and just and just keep going that way. But I wanted to try to talk about an episode that you did. I think it was last year. And uh, you were even on Free Man Beyond the Wall about about the same subject. And it's the Trump derangement syndrome, I think is what you called it. But now we've got a Trump Messiah syndrome as well. And I have noticed it. And I don't know if I see it more the way I'm looking at it now coming from the conservative side of it. Because whenever Obama was uh, president, during that whole run up to being elected, I saw him as being worshipped. And I was still that. Republican neocon, you know, that so I saw him as, you know, they're they're treating this guy like he's Jesus. He's coming to save us. But now it I, I recognize it with, with Trump as well because you can talk to you can talk to a Trump supporter and you could go down the line of all of his constitutional violations, but he's the greatest president ever. This is what this is what I get told. I, you know, and you can look on a Franklin Graham Facebook post and the 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 adoration these people have for trump is sickening it's gross to me personally because man when he was elected I, that's when i started noticing something was completely wrong with the way we were going with this country it seems like trump supporters have doubled down on their support for him because well we don't want the other guy in office so in your episode you you we've talked about the trump messiah syndrome and there's a coin that was being minted with uh, the image of trump and the image of Cyrus, and, and and I'll be the first to admit I'm not familiar with Cyrus. I, I did a little bit of reading on him, but if you could kind of tell us who Cyrus was briefly, and then talk about that that coin that was minted, and how they're they're treating this guy like he's some biblical figure, or like he was prophesied about in the Bible. Yeah, I, it's something that I I think the only people that can deny it are the people that are just totally. Um, misled by this whole thing. Uh, most people can see this, what, what I called in the episode, Trump Messiah syndrome. And to back up a little bit, um, the Trump derangement syndrome is something that um, the right has 
used um, rhetorically to make fun of and attack the left. And for good reason, um, you know, there, it's, it is pretty humorous seeing the, the left and the Democrat, you know, supporters just totally melt down by some of the things that he says. On the flip side, though, we see him say some of these things and we see the people on the right and the Republican side uh, just completely just eat it up and they love it. And um, and yeah, it's really bizarre to see some of these comparisons that people are making with Trump and biblical figures. And I, I just it, it's still going on. It happened, you know, in the lead up to the 2016 election and everything. And it's still going on. It, it's it's kind of maintained this whole time with making excuses for everything that he does. And and I think we're unfortunately going to see just a pickup that's a natural pickup of it because everyone's getting ready for the election and it's the most important election of our lives. And um, every four years. <laughs> yeah. And, and that rhetoric is really going to pick up. I, I, I think it already has where we're starting to see a lot of this messianic sort of comparisons and biblical comparisons are, are kind of, they're coming back and they're more strong. And in the lead up to the last election, we did see people like Franklin Graham, which I could be wrong, but I do think that that might kind of be where a lot of it started is where we saw him comparing Trump and the upcoming election to Moses and David. And I think a lot of very conservative organizations, Christian conservative organizations that, you know, their, their faith is, is directly tied to their political um, opinions and things like that, that they just took that and ran with it. And we started seeing lots of things come out and the public, the, you know, people really grabbed onto that. And you see it all the time, like I said, with just comparisons of, of him and being the savior of the, of the nation, which we did see to a certain degree with, with Obama. But I, I think, um, not just being the savior of the nation now, but I mean, even reaching into the Bible and finding these um, sometimes uh, obscure people um, or obscure characters or, um, you know, some of the figures in the Old Testament that aren't as well known as some of the others. You know, we, we have Moses and David and Noah, right? But then we have a lot of um, preachers or evangelists or, you know, pundits uh, mentioning people like Cyrus or Nehemiah, and they're reaching into the Bible and they're finding these things that were either prophesied or happened in the Bible, and they're applying them to today as if they were some sort of template or prophecy of what would happen today with Trump. And so what you see is a, a figure um, saving or helping the Jewish people in the Old Testament. And well, then you just you just apply that, you know, if Trump is him and the people of God are, are Americans, then, you know, it all makes sense, right? And, and this is something that we can hope for and have faith in, right? <laughs> and you start seeing, when you do step back, it, it's, it's terrible because you do see all of these things that are inherent in our faith. And um, you see them, completely misapplied. And if you do tell somebody, no, look, that that's you having faith in the government, that's you having faith in Trump, and that's you having faith in politics and Republicans and all these things, you know, and and not having faith in in God, well, no, they they tell you that that's not true. And, you know, there's all manner of excuses and stuff like that. But I think that when you do honestly step back and look at it and look at how terrible this this looks and now this really does apply once you start looking into you know what you just said like how that does apply when you're saying that the the old testament is pointing us to faith in in trump and saving the union you know uh something has really gone wrong here you know <laughs> what do you think the motivation behind it is though i mean what why are they so interested in in, in talking about something like that because it's it seems very dangerous to me to do something like that. You know, like you said, you're putting faith in government and not, you know, we use the slogan, uh, no king but Christ. 
and to me, that's the way every Christian should view it, you know, but what is their motivation? I mean, I, I don't understand the, the need to fall all over yourself to support somebody that is flawed, that is a human being. It's probably, you know, we're all flawed, which was the whole need for Christ anyway. But I don't know, man, it dri- I guess it just drives me crazy. It just pretty gross to me. And you will drive yourself crazy if you if you think about it too much and think too long on it. As far as what is really motivating all this, I think that there's a couple of different things. You know, you got to kind of identify your players here and you've got your politicians that like what we mentioned before are grabbing onto these things because the the Christian voter is a very large voting block, right? So you've got your your politician that really wants to play into this and uh, secure that next election or secure their next job, you know, as they're working for the Republican Party or something like that, right? Uh, Also... Another major player in this conversation is the televangelist that that's either directly a televangelist or that sort of person who's um, making a living off of this stuff. The I believe Jim Baker and Lance Wallnow and Jim Baker being, a, you know, a guy that's been around for a long time in the this televangelist, you know, money making scheming off of the, the church sort of a business practice. He's been around for a while. And Lance Wallnow is another guy that's, um, he's been doing this. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I really couldn't tell you. I have, I probably picked up on him about mm, maybe eight years ago or something like that. And he is uh, just as much the same thing. I, I, I'm not sure. Things don't really work out the same way they used to. And we kind of created that televangelist sort of character in the eighties and things like that. But it's playing out the same way. And those two guys are ones that are minting that coin, you know, and they're, they're selling it on TV or on their, their podcast or whatever it is that they're doing, their YouTube channel, wherever people are, are catching that stuff today. Uh, you know, I don't watch TBN, but I think it's still around. And I'm sure it's morphed into all the other forms of, of content that we have today. But you have those guys and um, they make a lot of money off of this stuff. And I would say Franklin Graham uh, is the same way. You know, we're talking guys that have um, affiliations with colleges and government grants and different uh, Christian organizations. And, you know, with Christianity, you have a lot of things that are just kind of inherent. And that is, you know, giving, giving money, which, you know, can either just be a particular, uh, you know, Christian's belief in either tithing or just uh, giving, uh, you know, voluntarily, you know, being charitable. But you have that and you, and you have um, these ideas of, of redemption and the, the, all these things that, that are in us, you know, that, that are part of our faith. And you can play on those things. And that's what we've, we've really seen with this. Um, we've seen these guys playing on, on these inherent things that are in our faith, you know, with redemption and faith. And it just, it gets twisted, you know, to, I think, make a buck or to secure your, you know, next, um, you know, reelection. And then what, these are the guys that are the players, right? And then there's also the, you know, the regular people, you know, the, the ones like you and me that are, you know, reading articles and uh, sharing memes and things like that uh, on social media. And, we're the ones that are that are preyed on by these sorts of people, right? Where we start, you know, getting scared about the, you know, the the left, uh, you know, intruding on our on our faith and you know, removing Christianity out of public school, or or uh, you know, all of society is going to break down um, and be become uh, an immoral cesspool, and so you have to vote Republican to save that to stop that from happening. You know, these are the sorts of things that are sold to Christians. And when you mix that with our inherent sort of um, desire for the good and the righteous and to be redeemed and forgiveness and charity, and you start mixing all that together, it, to me, it just it, it has seemed to be that way, that it has just led to Christians um, adopting this sort of messianic complex for for the the president yeah and i don't think it's going to get any better with this being an election year i don't think i don't think it's getting any any better we're probably going to see a lot of it i try to tune out as much as i can so what i try to do is counter with 
uh, memes with, you know, don't go vote type memes, you know. I don't know I mean, if, if people read it and then it upsets them, but, you know, the people that like it are, you know, like I said, in kind of the same like-minded as we are. But, you know, it is what it is. And I think uh, if we just, if we just kind of, if we do, you know, just follow Christ, you know, we, we talk to one person at a time, we'll see what happens. You know, with God, nothing, nothing is impossible. So we'll see, you know, we'll just, we'll just keep plugging along and doing what we're doing. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, something that I think you mentioned a little while ago with with the remnant. And um, I think keeping that in mind, keeping in mind that, um, you know, it, it's the the truth in, you know, your consistent politics or the truth in your faith. These things are the truth. Right. And we don't believe it because it's maybe, you know, maybe right, or maybe it's, uh, you know, a little bit easier to explain or something like that. You know, we, we believe in these things because it's the truth. And the thing is about the truth is that, um, I really feel strongly about this, that we put out that message of the truth and it is going to attract a lot of argument and a lot of fighting. And I think social media just kind of amplifies that, but, you know, just putting it out there. And if somebody, isn't going to, you know, right away, uh, pick up on it and believe, you know, exactly how, how you believe and, and all that. Um, it's not necessarily worth fighting about, you know, um, the truth will speak for itself. And, you know, that's one thing that, that I decided on a long time ago, because I definitely got mixed up into like the neocon fighting and bickering. And, you know, I was basically, you know, more prepared to even ask somebody if, you know, if they've, you know, given their life to, to the Republican party, you know, before I would even actually talk about Jesus. Right. And, and I'd get into like these arguments about, you know, politics and about our faith. And it was always like this fight. Like I, like I'm going to convince somebody by, by arguing this thing to death. And it's just, it, it's become apparent to me that that's just not the way that it works. Right. And if we do believe that we have truth on our side, then, Hey, that truth is either, it's going to resonate with that person or it's not. You know, and we see this this remnant that's spoken about in the Bible, and um, you know the episode that I did on it. It was kind of bringing up um, the parallels that uh, Albert Nock wrote about, where he was even relating that to this message of liberty, and that not to water down your message. And I would even say today, with the way that the culture is, you know, not even to fight about it, but you put out that truth, and the ones that are going to hear it, they're going to hear it you know, and, um, and not to, not to fight with everybody about it. And, and not only is that going to be better for you and your relationships with people, but it's going to be better for, for you and, you know, and your, you know, blood pressure and everything, you know, it's just to be able to, to know that it, you know, it's not you that's going to really convince somebody you're going to plant the seed. And, you know, if you're arguing about faith, it's going to be the Holy spirit that's going to, you know, change their hearts and, you know, be there when they come back and they say, okay, you know, this thing that you talked about, um, it's starting to make sense now. Tell me more about it. Right. And I think that's, and, and I'll be the first to admit, I'm, that's something I'm still working on as far as the arguing back. I mean, I used to be real bad about it. I feel like I've gotten better about it because kind of ending the debate and walking away from it because, and I don't know where it is in the Bible. Jesus talks about dusting your sandals off and just leave it be, you know, you've, you said what you got to say. There's no, you've, you get to a point where you realize that the person you're talking to has no interest in their mind being changed about what they believe as far as politics or religion. So and it's one thing I'm still working on myself. Well, and it's something that I, I, you know, I used to fight about that stuff all the time. And Oh yeah, me too. You know, I, I talked about my faith and, and my political direction kind of growing together. And I, yeah, the, the, the farther I've, I've gone from that neocon Christian, Republican, conservative sort of thinking, the further I've moved from that, the further I've moved into this, this uh, position that I, I think, um, you know, helps me uh, fulfill that commandment of loving my neighbor even more because I couldn't love my neighbor who thought differently for me. You know, they were the enemy, you know, <laughs> they were the, they were, you know, it was that, that left right tension that, that is uh, happening in, in politics, you know, the us versus them, A versus B, you know, R versus D. Um, sort of mentality. And that's, that's where we're living. We're living in that tension between the two where we're fighting each other, you know, and, and somehow the, the more aggressive we get, 
online, uh, the more we, I guess we think that it's going to convert them over, you know, but you know, uh, I don't know if anybody's actually been converted over through like just fighting about it, you know? <laughs> no, I think it pushes people away. And I, and I think, uh, and also, in speaking of the room that I said, I think if you're if you're getting ugly with somebody else online, I think it, it could tend to push them away too. That one of my biggest fears is is being a stumbling block to somebody. As far as you know, if, if, even if they're if they're not Christian and they're, they they're coming to the faith, or that's one of the biggest things I'm afraid of is is hurting you know their walk because of something I said. And I got a lot of. Uh, <laughs> got a lot of sins to repent from you know the way i used to act that way and you know I, I catch myself getting into it so i'm still and i'm still trying to work on that myself but you kind of grow day by day just take it one step at a time and see where we end up but man i think uh that might be a good ending spot that was that was pretty good stuff and i appreciate your time as well you know making some time to do this this was a lot of fun and i hope we can do it again I appreciate you having me on and I, I'd love to. I think that, you know, these are just great conversations to have. And I think it's something that we need to have more of when you, we just need to have conversations. You know, that's what um, I think that's what ultimately swayed me out of uh, where I was just having conversations with people and kind of people point me in the right direction. And so that's what, uh, it's the conversations I think that are going to ultimately, um, you know, uh, help this uh this movement if we're going to call it that you know move forward right on well uh before we get off here do you uh, want to plug anarcho christian most of the people are going to be familiar with you anyway that are listening but for future listeners that are not go ahead and tell us all about anarcho christian i appreciate it yeah um so anarcho christian is a website and a podcast and you can find all of that at anarchochristian.com you'll find articles and um, links to the individual podcast episodes. But you could also um, find the podcast on any podcatcher platform, you know, YouTube or Spotify, Apple, Google Play, all that stuff. Anywhere where, you know, you're, where you're listening to The Bad Roman, you can find uh, Anarcho Christian as well. And um, also there's uh, the social media pages for you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, I stay pretty active with all of that uh, as well. Our, private group where you can have uh, a little bit more in-depth discussions about some of these things, uh, either it's faith or politics or both or, or, you know, anything else. We just try to have a good time and, and, um, you know, I appreciate it. If anybody wants, wants to check that out, um, you know, you can reach out to me in the, in the group or through the website. And uh, again, that's anarchochristian.com. And that'll, that's pretty much the hub. That'll take you to anything that you're looking for with Anarcho Christian. Awesome. Uh, that, that group's awesome. If anybody that's listening to this has not joined that group, I highly recommend it. There's some fun conversations that go in, go down in there. It, it's, it's funny to watch a bunch of anarchists get together. <laughs> and then you, get, then you add uh, Christian anarchists, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So the differing, the differing uh, theologies in there, you know, I've, I've learned a lot of stuff about myself just by being in that group because there's a lot of things I held on to theology wise that I'd no longer do just by having conversations with that group. So it's very been very helpful for me as well. No, I'm really happy to hear that. I'm very proud of our group and it's really turned into a little family. <laughs> and it's, it's, it is very funny because we do come from such vastly different backgrounds, both politically and uh, and in our faith, you know, so we have a lot of people interacting that are, you know, of all different denominations or non-denominations. And, uh, it's really made for some good conversation. I, I think that, um, it catches some people by surprise sometimes, but that's what we've tried to build is an, an open forum to talk about any of these things from whatever background you have. Um, we have people that are not Christians in the group, but they're interested in what we have to say and how we talk about it. And um, it really has proven that you can have this open discussion and open dialogue, you know, about Christianity and politics. And I think really learn a lot about ourselves and, and the people around us. Lots of fun. Yeah. I, I highly encourage anybody listening to go join that group. And I appreciate your time, buddy. Thank you again. And yeah, let's, uh, let's do this again. 
Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. 